Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at our service. We're here every Sunday at half past ten, and we're also here on a Tuesday at seven o'clock for our Bible study. God bless you. Tell me what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not God and pray. Tell me how we trials and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? Never be discouraged Come on and take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrows share Cause Jesus knows our every chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. If you, I'm going to put it up the screen. If you have your Bible, that's fine. <clears throat> and
and it's Ezekiel chapter 3 I'm at the first verse <clears throat> Sorry. If all else fails, follow the instructions. Praise God. Right, the scripture. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it. And it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You're not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but to the people of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and strange language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and as hardened as they are. And I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully. And take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the Lord rose from the place where it was standing. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling, rumbling sound. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. And I came to the exiled who lived in Tel at Tel Aviv near the Kibar River, and there where they were living I sat among them for seven days deeply distressed. At the end of the seven days the word of the Lord came to me. Praise God for this reading. Now, this is a, an interesting reading. We're told, we're told about a prophet who's being instructed in a very special way. He was given the word of God. He had to stomach it, first of all. He had to stomach. A lot of people can't stomach the word of God. He was told to eat the scroll. And when he ate it, it was like honey in his mouth. But you see, here's the thing. The man was said, you're not going to a people whose speech is obscure. We're not going to Hong Kong where we haven't a clue what they're saying. You know, we're not even going south of the border. Or if you ever go to Fraserburgh, I haven't a clue what they're talking about. But you see, you're going to your own people. And I'm going to say sometimes, that's sometimes the hardest people to go to. And they said, the Lord said to Ezekiel, if I sent you to a people of a strange language, they would listen to you. Now, I don't know if you've preached abroad. I've preached abroad. Sometimes you had an interpreter with you. Well, you would need an interpreter because they didn't know what you were saying. And you would sometimes wonder about these interpreters because if they didn't they laugh eh, when you told a joke, but they laughed when you weren't telling a joke, you used to wonder if the interpreter was preaching your sermon. So you, were, you had to trust the interpreter that they were actually faithfully... I remember preaching uh, in uh, Belgium and they were translating into Flemish and the guy was very good but he got stuck when this fella was going on about a, a bing. He started talking about a bing which is a big heap of ash and the man couldn't translate that. You know, He struggled. And sometimes we can't translate but the interesting thing was uh, if you ever read, if you've read Davy Lawson's book, uh, Davy did a lot of travelling about the world, and uh, David, uh, he's not always the most eloquent of speakers. But I'll tell you one thing: he went to these countries and he got results. 
And you come to your own people and you get a hard and a stubborn people. And God was sending Ezekiel to his own people and he says they'll be hard and rebellious. And there was an anger, but there was a compulsion. There was the draw of God and there was the call of God and the word was given and the power was behind him and there was a rumbling, there was a moving. Have you ever been moved into action? And sometimes, you know, it takes a bit of dynamite to get some of the Christians into action. It takes a bit of rumbling at the back and a bit of revelation, a bit of the power of God before they'll do anything. And what makes it difficult is the anticipation. They're not even going to listen to me. But God said, go, go, go. And we've got to go. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that is believed and baptized will be saved. And he that doesn't believe will be damned. It's so important. The word of God is what this world needs. We have advertisements all the time trying to sell us stuff. We have voices all the time. We're living in the communications age where we can't escape messages. Messages are bombarding us day and night. But the only one message that we need is the word of, the, of God. And when I talk about the word of God, I mean what God is saying for that people and in that season. You know, some people are a bit random about it. I told you the story about the wee man on the bus. There's a text in the Bible that says, Why, oh, why will you die? And this wee man, he was a bit of a street preacher, and he saw people working on a Sunday, and he, that displeased him because that was the Lord's day. So uh, the bus had a wee window at the side, and he slipped it down, and he screamed out through the wee bus window, Why, oh, why will you die? Now here were these guys getting double time for working on a Sunday. And here was a man declaring the word of the Lord. He says, the word of the Lord will not return to me void. Now the man had got the whole thing the wrong way around. That's a, what God is saying to that people for that season will not return. I mean, Paul himself tells us, rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't take a lump of the word and throw it at people. You've got to give the word that God gives. And that's called discernment and discretion. And we need a people who are able to handle the word of God and to bring the word of God to men and women because there is a famine of the word of God. There's plenty of food in this country. Now maybe after Halloween, after October, when we've eaten all our monkey nuts and our, and our Halloween apples, and then suddenly the boats can't get into Cali, and the boats can't get into Dover, there might be a real famine. We might all be growing potatoes in our back gardens. Because they're still fighting about the paperwork and the channel tunnel queues are going for 20 miles or 30 miles or all the way back to Paris. We don't know. How would we feel if we had a famine? How would we feel? Ah, we've never really had a famine since they had the ration books back in the 50s after the war. We've, 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 we've lived in abundance. We don't know what a famine is, but I'm telling you now, there is a famine in this country, and it is a famine of the Word of God. People need to know what God has got to say on the matter. Amen. People need to know what God has got to say on the matter. That is the priority. That is it, because His words are life. You know, Jesus was feeding the multitude, and they all came. Because they were getting fed. They were getting fed physical food. And they came and they saw the miracles and the healings. But there came a time when the Lord's sayings get very, very hard. You heard about the hard sayings of Jesus? Have you heard about them? A lot of our churches need to read all the, what they call the hard sayings of Jesus. It's, uh, you have heard it said unto you, do not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that he that looks upon a woman... Lust after a woman has committed adultery in his heart. That's what you call a hard saying. You have heard it said unto you, you know, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, that he who calls his brother rackle or fool, he has murdered them in his heart. The hard saying of Jesus takes it to the next level, where we live a life which is holy and just and true. And I'm going to say something to you. If you're going to take the word of God to this, your own people, not a people of a strange speech, but a people who have your own speech, a people of your own culture, a people of your own nation, 
and you are not living a life worthy of the word that you're taking to them, they're not going to accept it. They won't stomach the word. Now Ezekiel was told to stomach the word, to physically swallow the word. How are they going to stomach it if they don't see it in you? When we have holiness as our mantle, when we have righteousness, when we live in the power and the anointing of the Lord, when things are happening which are supernatural, when God is seen to be in their lives, and when we speak the word, people will listen. People will listen. People will listen. Now what I want to say to us is the very last uh, verse that we read there. I want to bring this up. So after all this came, the call, now he went, the exiles lived at Tel Aviv. Now in the King James it's called Tel Aviv. Now that's no Tel Aviv in Israel where David landed 20 years ago. This is a different Tel Aviv. Now Tel is a big mountain. It, the archaeologists dig up Tels because it tells a story. A Tel is where civilization has built on top of each other. And that's what they call a Tel. Now Tel Aviv was actually in Babylon. It was about 50 miles from Babel. I'm not exactly sure. It was where the people had been taken away out of their own land as slaves because they had forsaken the Lord. They were taken into exile. And there they were by the Brook Keber, which was probably a big canal. And they sat there. And they, had, they didn't have their own land anymore. They were in a strange land. But they were amongst their own people. And they were there as a, the consequences of their sin. And they were in trouble because they'd lost the land that God had given them. They'd lost their relationship with God and they'd lost the reason for life. Now, I want you to notice something. After Ezekiel had been given the call, after he had been given the command, after all the rumbling and the power and the anointing and the things that had happened in him, and praise God that God prepares us for a ministry. What did he do? He did nothing. He says he sat down. Is that right? I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. He sat where they sat for a whole week. He sat amongst them. Now in here, this message is a rebuke to us. You know what people... The Bible says fools rush in for angels fear to tread. And you, and you know, some evangelists, they trample over all your emotions and all your feelings just to hammer you that you need to repent and get right with God. Willie Watt, who stood in this pulpit, told a story. You remember Willie Watt from Hamilton? Pray for Willie. Willie's going for an operation on his foot. He, they've, they've got this church in Hamilton, a new building, and it's all going well, and they're having great meetings now, so pray for Wally. But Wally tells a story that when he came to Glasgow with his wife, he, he, there was a guy sitting begging, and his wife said to him, What about that man? You're a Christian, do you know love that man? And Wally was kind of backed into a corner, and Wally told a story from this platform. He said, he went up and he sat down by the beggar. He actually sat on the ground beside the man. And he said to the man, Well, what's your story? That was his opening words. And he let this man tell him all about his life, all about his misfortunes, all about his troubles, and, and all he did was sit and sit and sit and sit. And when the man had finished talking, suddenly a door opened where Willie could actually minister the life of Christ in this life. And I think there's a lesson here. You know, this church, we are trying to do community things. We're trying to do mother and toddler groups. Flo had a fantastic time last night. We've had cough, coffee bars and all sorts of stuff. And people say, what are you doing? Why don't you just preach the word? Why don't you just preach? And you know, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you something about a lot of people that love preaching the word. They like to do it like me if you're behind a pulpit. Because they like a wall between you and them. I remember going to speak to a well known preacher. I was really impressed with preaching. And I crossed the line behind his pulpit to ask him something. And the man looked horrified. And he made, he made short shift to me and made it, made it uh, sure to me he didn't really want to talk to me. He was quite happy to shout down for the pulpit to me. 
and all the others. But as soon as I crossed behind the pulpit and tried to talk to him, and I remember as a young Christian feeling devastated. I was impressed by this man's mighty preaching. He was an international preacher. But as soon as I tried to talk to him as an individual, he made it known to me he was not interested. He was only interested in preaching to the great multitudes. Not so Ezekiel. He sat down where they sat. He sat where they sat. And where were they sitting? They were sitting as losers. They were sitting in trouble. They were sitting as captives and slaves and exiles in a strange land. And he sat amongst them. There's a story goes about a, a preacher man who worked a, in a leper colony. And he ministered to these lepers day and night trying to help them medically. And one day he went amongst them and he sat amongst them and he says, I want to tell you people something now. Because these people weren't allowed to get into society because they could contaminate. He says, I'm now one of you. What did he mean? He meant he had actually contracted the leprosy that he was actually trying to help them overcome. He'd actually became as one of them to serve them. He took that risk and he became as one of them. I was a, a teacher in a school and uh, I remember we had a wee Johnny and the wee Johnny, he had some physical disability but what I didn't know was he actually attended that school for special needs pupils as a pupil. And when we were saying our farewell to, to Richard, he stood up to say cheerio to all the, all the students, all the, the, the boys and girls in the school. And his first words were, I'm one of you. I'm one of you. He says, I sat where you sat in the classes. He says, and I'm one of you. And I'll tell you, you get more respect than all these highfalutin teachers that drove in in their fancy motors for their nice house in the States. He says, I'm one of you. You know, we need to become lowly. We need to serve. If we're going to reach the lost, that's why we have a community program in this church. No, because we've become a social church. But we need to be able to sit with people instead of preach at people from behind the parapet. It's a bit like, you know, these snipers that pop their heads up and take a pot shot. Some preachers are like that. They don't get you with that text, they'll get you with this text. You know, or they might throw a hand grenade. John 3.16 is a great hand grenade, you know, or something else. But you see, to go out and to sit with people and look at the Lord, the example. He was the man who stood by the well. Because a woman was coming that way. He was out for the individual. You, know, you watch the way he talks to her. He gets a story. Nicodemus. The rich man. Who uh, he went away sad because he had great possessions. The Lord is interested in the individual. And if you're not interested in the individual, there's something wrong with your Christianity. I believe that we need to learn to sit where people are sitting and hear their story. We need to stop retreating behind the parapet. We need to become exposed to the needs of men and women because we're living in a sad, sad generation. Now, I would like you, as Eugenia goes home, to remember Eugenia. Because Eugenia's gone home to a political situation that I wouldn't like to be in. You know, where democracy is it threat? Where we don't know what the outcome's going to be for her future and for her liberty. We don't know. And she needs our prayers. She needs our empathy. And she doesn't need our sympathy. But she needs our empathy and she needs our prayers. And the Holy Spirit can actually... You ever heard the people who <coughs> interceded and they travailed in prayer. You don't hear that phrase very much about people who travail in prayer. What does travailing mean? Well, when a woman's having a baby, she travails. She goes into the, the labour pains that brings forth life. And we as Christians have to learn to actually go into, by the Spirit, praying and winning battles in the, vic in the spiritual place to bring souls to Christ. We need to stop being remote. We need to be like Ezekiel, who sat with them 
where they sat. And then, when the time came, what happened? The word of the Lord came to him. I'm praying that God will give us a burden. I believe that every soul in this building who's a Christian could actually lead another soul to Christ. And if we did that in a week, this church could double. And if you take the the mathematics of it, if that happened throughout the nation, if every soul won one soul, the church could revive in a very, very short time. But we've got to have the compassion. We need to get rid of the siege mentality. We need to get rid of the ideas that it's something that is done in our leisure or in our pleasure. But we need to enter into the needs of this present generation. Aren't you, isn't it good that Jesus became a man? God became a man in Christ Jesus. He said he was humbled. He humbled himself. He says there's no nothing that has happened to any human in human experience that Christ cannot identify with. <coughs> he became one of us. He sat where we sat. Have you ever recognized that? That before Jesus Christ was crucified, he actually sat in this world. He lived the life that we live, and he's told us to do the same. So let's handle the word of God. If you're not a Christian, Take on heart what I've told you t tonight. We need the word of God. You become a Christian not by what you think or what your opinion is, but what God has said and God has spoken. And what is God's word? Well, if you read John's Gospel, the word became flesh. That is the word of God. It is a person. It was packaged up in a person. Jesus Christ is the message. That God has given this world. We can accept him. Or we can reject him. The, the litmus test. Of this society is one thing. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Now the crowd cried out. Give us Barabbas. And what will you do with Jesus? Crucify him. Now in the Old Testament. We read. About a. Joshua saying, why do you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be Lord, God serve him. Uh, and we have to make our minds up that we're going to accept the word of God and we're going to follow through what God has for us. Now I'm just praying tonight that something that's been said will help each one of us. You know, I've I got a message for you, a brother, he's not here tonight, he's here this morning, about building an altar. Uh, it was quite an interesting message. And some of the stuff I took out of it, and one of the things was that every Christian should have a place where they meet with God. Now, I would say, because the Lord said to the women at the well, it's neither Jerusalem nor Samaria or this mountain, for God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him. Now, I know that geographical location is not that important. But wouldn't it be good if you had a place, we watched a film in here one night of a, a, a called The War Room, but this woman had a wee room in her house, and when she shut the door in that wee room, she was meeting with God. She was meeting with God. And what happened in that wee room affected a whole lot of lives outside of that wee room. And I believe that we need to find our place with God. We need to find our place with God that when we minister to people, we minister out of compassion. We minister out of reality. We minister out of understanding and care, just as Christ cared for us. So that's my message tonight. I'm encouraging you to win somebody to Christ this week. I'm encouraging you to seek the Lord and to say, God, who is it you're talking to me about? What is it I have to do? I'm encouraging you to have feelings for them before you launch in. And wait, wait, learn to wait until the Lord has the word for you. I knew a guy in Blackpool who used to go and minister to the young folk down <laughs> in, the, in the Golden Mile in Blackpool. But before he ever went near when I even a gospel tract, he would stand and stand and stand until he suddenly felt compassion. 
till he felt love, till <coughs> when he felt care, then he would approach them. He would never go to them cold. And I think we need to learn the skills of being witnesses for Jesus Christ again. I really believe that. I believe we need to learn through this passage that we need to sit where people sit so that we can minister what God did for us. He sat where we sat and became one of us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, I think there's a closing hymn, David. Teach me thy way, help me to walk aright, by faith and not by sight, lead me with heavenly light, teach me thy way. When I am sad at heart, teach me thy way. When earthly joys depart, teach me thy way. In times of loneliness, in times of dire distress, in failure or success, teach me thy way. When doubts and fears arise, teach me thy way. When storms overspread my sky, teach me thy way. Shine through the cloud and the rain, through sorrow, through the pain. Make thou my pathway plain, teach me thy way. As we begin to a new week, we pray God's richest blessing on your life and your family and friends. God bless you.